Okay, so today we're going to start blood, the first part of the cardiovascular system. And blood is actually connective tissue. So if you remember in ANP1, we did connective tissue. So blood is really connective tissue. And the reason we call it connective tissue is if you look at connective tissue, connective tissue has cells. It has fibers and it has ground substance. Blood is actually called a typical type of connective tissue. It's called a typical connective tissue. The reason is because you have cells in blood. Does can anyone tell me about some of the cells which you see in blood? Yep. White blood cells and platelets. So you see the cells. There is ground substance present in blood, which is the plasma. Okay. So if you took the red blood, if you took all the cells out, especially the red blood cells, the, what is left behind the fluid in which all these cells are suspended is really straw colored. And that's called plasma. And when plasma kind of, when blood clots and what is left behind the plasma, that is called serum. So serum is similar to plasma, but it is usually minus proteins. So serum is the same as plasma, but minus proteins. So in blood, we see cells and we see ground substance. Connective tissue, however, has fibers too, you know, like collagen or elastic or those kind of fibers. In blood, you do not see the fibers normally. You only see the fibers when blood clots. And the fibers that you see are known as fibrin. So since fibers are not seen at all times and only seen when blood clots, that's why we call blood an atypical type of connective tissue. So now let's look at some of the constituents of blood. So first is ground substance which is plasma, and it forms the majority of blood, about 55%. And then here are the fibers, fibrin, which only see, only get, you get to see when blood clots. And then we have cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Men normally have a greater blood volume than females. One, because of a larger surface area. Plus, they have testosterone, and testosterone produces more blood cells, helps to produce more blood cells. So, normal blood volume in females is about close to 5 liters. In males, it's a little bit more, about 6 liters. Now, let's look at some properties of plasma. As I said, it's liquid, mainly uh, it forms 55% of the blood. Its pH is alkaline. It's between 7.35 to 7.45. I've only given you, but there's always a range between 7.35 to 7.45. And it contains, as you can see, many substance in, substances in it. It contains some large proteins, which are known as plasma proteins. You may, um, I don't know how many of you have ever had a blood test, but have you heard of something called serum albumin? Right, any of you? Okay, you get your blood tested sometimes, especially uh, pregnant women get that tested, or if you have some kidney problem, you get this tested, so it's called albumin. So that's a huge protein that's present in blood. Then you have globulins, uh, which are also known as gamma globulins, Globulins are also known as gamma globulins. Some of these you know as antibodies, right? When you get a vaccine, especially a live vaccine, you, your body begins to produce antibodies. Antibodies are gamma globulins, so you have globulins. Then you have another protein called fibrinogen, which is used for clotting. So 
So these are some big proteins which are present in blood and fibrinogen is one of the largest proteins that you see. There are other smaller proteins, but these are some main ones. Um, like I said, fibrinogen for clotting, globulins for production of antibody. Albumins are large proteins which are responsible for maintaining something known as the osmotic pressure of blood. And I'll show you that in the next slide. So albumins are responsible for maintaining osmotic pressure of blood. All of these proteins remain in the blood. They actually don't kind of seep out of the blood vessels. They're not able to pass through blood vessels and get out. They have to go have a special way to get out. And because they are present inside a blood vessel, they exert what I said is osmotic pressure. And they're really, really important because that's how it helps blood, which is thrown out of a blood vessel. It helps it to come back into the blood vessel. Okay. Then we have gases, which are carried in the plasma. Can anybody think of any gases which are carried in plasma? Oxygen, yes. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, the two main gases which are transported in plasma. Nutrients, lots of nutrients, vitamins, you know, your amino acids, which make up proteins. Then we have glucose, which is the simplest form of sugar. Then you have what are called fatty acids and glycerol, which form fats, fatty acids and glycerol. So they are also present in the plasma. So they are all suspended in the plasma. That's how they go from one place to the other. Because blood is a transport system. We also have electrolytes. Anybody? Name some electrolytes. Okay, potassium. Chloride. Bicarbonate. Hydrogen. Ions. All these are electrolytes, you know. Uh, you may, again, when you get a blood test done, so especially when people are dehydrated, they have kidney problems, you get something known as serum electrolytes. You try to see, is their body um, having the normal amount of electrolytes present? So that those are known as serum electrolytes. Calcium is another electrolyte which is there, okay? Then also present in, in the plasma are these agglutinins or antibodies up here, which remember I said were gamma globulins. So antibodies are present in the plasma. Okay. And they're called agglutinins are also known as gamma globulins. Then as I said, fibrin, and then we have these cells. So remember I talked about osmosis and osmotic pressure. So what happens, how does, the, how is albumin important and how, uh, how do these plasma proteins, of which albumin is one of them, how do they help to kind of maintain the osmotic pressure of blood? So here what you're looking at is towards the tissues. When you go right to the tissues, blood vessels, you know, they start out big. They are like a highway. You know, you have a huge US-19 and then that kind of becomes, you know, it gives off a little, little sort of, side roads which get smaller and smaller till you kind of finally reach a neighborhood. So imagine the houses in the neighborhood are the cells and those tiny little roads are the tiny capillaries which come off of a big blood vessel. So this is a capillary which is present. So this is the arterial end of a capillary which you can see up here and this is the venous end of a capillary. So at the arterial end blood flows again with great pressure. And as it's flowing at, with great pressure, slowly it kind of becomes very, very, very sluggish. So by the time it reaches the venous end of the capillary, the blood flow has slowed down. So the pressure also is much less than at the arterial end. Okay. It's imagine like a hose. So the hose which is closest to the faucet, the pressure is greatest there, right? And by the time, so if you have a really long hose, by the time you have the hose, which is where you're watering the plants, the pressure is much less at the other end. The pressure which is exerted by fluid, in this case, it's blood in a hose, it's water. That pressure is known as hydrostatic pressure. Hydro means water. H 
hydrostatic pressure always tends to throw fluid out. So again, if I gave you this example of a hose, so if this is a hose, and this hose had tiny holes in it, and you turned on the faucet, okay, so this was the little tap which went and water went out, and you turned it on real good so that water was flowing through that, what would happen? Yes, it would come out through the holes, right? Because the pressure of water, it, since it finds a gap, it'll, it's going to throw it out. Same thing happens in the blood vessels. When you look at a blood vessel, the blood vessel is lined by cells called endothelial cells, right? Remember simple squamous epithelium? In blood vessels, it's known as endothelium. These are the endothelial cells. In between the endothelial cells are tiny pores or tiny gaps. They are small enough to let fluid pass through and small molecules pass through, but they don't let big molecules like your proteins get through. So at the arterial end, you can see that the hydrostatic pressure is quite high and let's say we take it as 35 millimeters of mercury. So since it's flowing from here, there would be a tendency for fluid, the plasma to pass out. Red blood cells, white blood cells which are large or proteins cannot get out. Okay, And where do they pass out? They pass out into spaces which are present here which is known as the interstitial space and because it's fluid there, this is called interstitial fluid. From here, they will go towards the cells because the cells are all bathed by this interstitial fluid. Have you followed? So from the blood, if any nutrient, any gas has to go to the cells, it will pass through this, through the interstitial fluid and into the cells. If any waste product has to come from the cells and get into the blood, it will go in the reverse fashion. Followed? Okay. Now, at the same time, suppose you threw all the water out. By the time it reaches the venous end, then all your fluid has gone out. So the blood volume would become really less, wouldn't it? Okay. So there is a counteracting force in a blood vessel, which is known as the osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure has, if you remember when you did ANP1, if, uh, do you remember doing something called hypotonic and hypertonic solution? Hmm? Right? Okay, so let me kind of um, review that for you quickly. So if you have a solution, two solutions up here, one has got pure water, and let's say here is a semi-permeable membrane, which is allowing only water to go through. And here you have water, but you also have a solution with salt in it and other things. So these are called solutes and water is the solvent. This solution is, is got a mixture of water and solutes. This has only got water, right? So this solution is said to be hypertonic. And this solution is said to be hypotonic. The reason being the concentration of water is more here. And concentration of water is less here. Followed? So water will flow from here to here. So what do we say? Hypertonic solutions have the ability to draw water towards them. Isn't it? This is a hypertonic solution. So what is it doing? It's drawing water towards it. Okay. If you had a closed sort of space where you can only draw water, but you cannot increase the volume, this is going to generate some pressure. That pressure is known as osmotic pressure. And if you remember, osmosis is just the movement of water from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Right? Remember that? Okay? So similarly, over here, if you look here, because inside a blood vessel you have fluid which is plasma, but the plasma has those solutes. So I don't know if you can see the color, so let's change the color. So here are those solutes like albumin, fibrinogen, you also have the ions. So these solutes are much more here compared to this interstitial fluid. So they will exert an osmotic pressure, which means they will want to draw fluid back into the blood vessel. Okay. So this is known as osmotic pressure. And here this is hydrostatic pressure. So hydrostatic pressure throws fluid out. 
osmotic pressure draws fluid in now let's look at this picture so just it's really quite simple if you just follow this picture so here is the arterial end of a capillary here is the venous end of a capillary at the arterial end blood is flowing at a great pressure so your hydrostatic pressure is 35 mm by the time it comes to the venous end of the capillary the pressure the blood is now flowing a little bit more sluggishly the pressure is decreased so it's 17 mm both at both places there is a tendency to throw fluid out because that's what hydrostatic pressure does right it throws fluid out at the arterial end and at the venous end you also have osmotic pressure because that's because of the presence of these solutes so they the uh, osmotic pressure at the arterial end is 25 mm of mercury at the venous end also it will remain 25 because these solutes are it's not decreasing the solutes are the same at the arterial end they are same as the venous end so the solute pressure at both the arterial and venous end is the same can you see the the reason why so can you see that whether fluid will go out or whether it will come back into the blood vessel depends on the difference between the hydrostatic and the osmotic pressure so at the arterial end which one is more hydrostatic or osmotic hydrostatic so what happens can you see that the net pressure is 10 millimeters and that throws fluid out into the interstitial space when you come and this fluid will go out into the interstitial space it bathes all these cells and it will go into the cell so that's how the cells actually get their intracellular cytoplasmic fluid now if you threw everything out what would happen by the time you get back into the venous end of the capillary you'll have no fluid left so you have to bring some fluid back right So here at the venous end of the capillary look at it the osmotic pressure is 25 the hydrostatic is 17 so which one wins now osmotic so that's why can you see that fluid goes back in so it's getting back out from here and going back in through the venous end and that's how your blood volume is kept constant do you understand if at any point the hydrostatic pressure increases too much or the osmotic pressure decreases too much then you will find that too much fluid will go out less will come in so all of that fluid will kind of stay here in in the interstitial space and that's when you get something known as edema which is swelling have you ever seen people with you know especially when they suffer from kidney disease and all they look a little bit swollen right that's what happens that's called edema So let's look at this little video which we can do here and again this is to explain hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure. So here what we are going to do is oh uh, you to illustrate how greater number of particles in a vessel increases osmotic or pulling pressure. So what you're doing is you begin with two mesh bags. So you know they've got little holes in it. So imagine each is to a blood vessel. and now there's six measuring cups with four sponges each so uh, that can be identified so you can see this albumin is this this is sodium and this is glucose so it says is drag six measuring cups on the left to bag a So this blood vessel you can see has a lot of albumin a lot of sodium and a lot of glucose right and then we drag 3 into bag B So which has more solutes A Okay now e that each bag is filled with particles similar to a person's blood with albumin sodium and glucose you can check the osmotic or pulling pressure so click on each bag and drag it to the water so so that's what it's filled with and i drag this okay now it's time to measure how much fluid there is in each bag so we take this
So right from this, you can see which dragged more fluid, A or B? A, because it had more solutes in it, right? Got it? So the more solutes you have, the more fluid you can drag back into the blood vessel. The less you have, the less you will drag back. So bag A had twice the pulling power. So therefore, bloodstream with higher levels of albumin, sodium and glucose, which also have a higher degree of pulling. The higher the osmolarity, the greater the pulling power. So if somebody was not making enough proteins or they were losing proteins in their, say they had kidney disease or something and they lost proteins, what would happen? Their pulling power would be less. So fluid would remain outside and they would have edema. We followed that? So, okay, so we finished this. So let's go back to, so now is a question that I have. Okay, for some reason my thing is not working. Okay, so y'all should be able to pull. Yeah. So what would be the effect when the body lacks or loses proteins such as in kidney or liver disease or malnutrition? Somebody's uh, thing is not working, I think. So you may, might want to change your... Okay, very good. Yes, the person would have edema. So breathing problems are not a thing. The blood volume will not decrease. Cons when, why you won't choose that the blood volume won't decrease considerably is that uh, there are other ways that blood can actually go back. The fluid goes back through the lymphatic system. But so little bit gets remained. It's not like your blood volume is going to totally decrease because proteins are lost. You'll still have some going back in. And the body temperature can still be maintained. It has nothing to do with plasma proteins, though that's a function of, of blood because, uh, you know, when you know when somebody is feeling cold, that at that time you kind of shiver and, you know, less blood goes to that area so that you don't want heat to be radiated. So body temperature can still be maintained. So therefore, edema is what you're going to get in such a condition, okay? Now, the reason I said kidney or liver disease or malnutrition, I mentioned kidney is because your kidney could be malfunctioning. Uh, so, the, normally blood is filtered through the kidney and these large molecules like uh, proteins or blood cells do not pass through the kidney. If the kidney is not functioning properly, the holes or the, in the filtration membrane are so large that the person actually passes protein through the kidney and that's why they look very, very swollen. Plasma proteins are manufactured in the liver. All Many of the proteins are manufactured in the liver with the result that when these plasma proteins, when the, there is a liver disease, the plasma proteins are lacking. So these people also could look swollen. Um, if fibrinogen is not present, a person with liver disease might have something like, uh, which is like a bleeding disorder because, you know, fibrinogen is meant for clotting. So they could have that. Malnutrition is, say, every, the kidney is functioning normally or liver is functioning normally, but if you don't eat right, let's say somebody is eating an, a protein deficient diet or they are starved, so then again, they are, the body is not able to produce enough, so you will find that many people who are starved at later stages, they actually look, their stomach is enlarged and looks very edematous, okay? So that's why I put all those three in. So let's look at red blood cells now. So we did plasma. So we're looking at cells. 
red blood cells are one of the few living cells in the body which do not have a nucleus. So they're non-nucleated, which means they cannot divide and reproduce. They're also biconcave, which means that if you look at a red blood cell from the side, this is how the cell will look. It's very thin in the center. So it's thin up here and thicker on the side. And this biconcave nature helps because it makes it very easy to squeeze itself and pass through narrow capillaries. So that's how, you know, the capillaries are very, very thin blood vessels. So it helps it to pass through. They are red in color because of this pigment called hemoglobin, which is really, really important. And hemoglobin has this oxygen carrying capacity. In fact, the oxygen carrying capacity of blood is due to hemoglobin. So this is what binds to oxygen. Hemoglobin has two parts to it. There's a heme pigment, which contains iron and globin, which is the protein. It's the iron which kind of helps to bind to oxygen. Uh, normal red blood cell count, you can see up there, it, it is the largest number of cells of the blood cells. In other words, red blood cells are much, much more than white blood cells or platelets because it's in millions. So there are about 5.2 million in, in males and 4.5 million uh, per cubic millimeter in females. Now, red blood cells need to have something and they need to be uh, to make them uh, to kind of generate them and they need to be generated somewhere. So they are generated in the bone marrow. And um, in children, they are generated in most of the long bones also. But in us, they usually at the end, the bone marrow is present at the ends of the long bones or in flat bones. And this process of production of red blood cells is known as erythropoiesis. Does anyone know why it's called erythropoiesis? Yes, a red blood cell is also known as erythrocyte. It's also called erythrocyte, so erythropoiesis, and this is controlled. This control of erythropoiesis is through a hormone known as erythropoietin, which is produced by the kidneys. And this is really, really important because erythropoiesis is what determines the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. Your main function of blood is transport of gases and you want oxygen to be carried from the heart to the tissues and from the tissues carbon dioxide comes back through the blood and you know you expire that. So the oxygen carrying capacity is determined by how well erythropoiesis occurs in your body and that is controlled by this hormone called erythropoietin produced by the kidneys. Okay. Now, there are two terms that you must know. One is known as anemia, whenever the oxygen carrying capacity is decreased. We call that anemia, which could be. So, anemia could be a condition where the red blood cell count is less than normal. So, the red blood cell count is low. Or it could also be where the red blood cell count may be normal, but the hemoglobin is low. So that means each red blood cell does not have the adequate amount of hemoglobin it's supposed to have in it. So either your red blood cell count is low or your hemoglobin count is low. Normally hemoglobin is about, in females, uh, hemoglobin is about 12 to 16 gram percent. In females, in males, it's about 13 to 18 gram percent. Now, every lab has slight variations, but this is about a general rule. So, if it is less than 12 in females, we say they are anemic. If it's kind of 9, we say they're terribly anemic. In males, it should be between 13 to 18 gram percent, okay? So, anemia is a condition where the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is reduced because either the red blood cell count is low or the hemoglobin count is low. The opposite, which is polycythemia, the word poly means many. So polycythemia is a condition where the red blood cell count is high. Not hemoglobin, just the red blood cell count is high. 
and automatically the hemoglobin count also becomes high if you know provided each cell has the normal amount of hemoglobin but by definition polycythemia only refers to high red cell count so if with another words this person's oxygen carrying capacity would be really high isn't it so in order to see sometimes we have a very simple test in order to see whether a person's red cell count is normal or not what we do is we do something known as a hematocrit or what is also called a packed cell volume pcv packed cell volume so we take blood and we centrifuge it and when you centrifuge it it will kind of settle like this because red cells are so many in number and they are heavy they settle at the bottom so it's red in color and then you have a kind of a very thin beige colored coat which is known as a buffy coat and then on top you have the straw colored plasma so you can see from this image you have plasma which is on top which is a large straw colored layer a, then a thin layer known as a buffy coat which is made up of white blood cells and platelets and then here we have this red cell column this red cell column is what is called the packed cell volume or the hematocrit so this normal red cell column the height of this red cell column in women is about 42 mm and in men so this is in women in men it's about 47 mm so if the height is not normal then we we'll, we can immediately deduce whether a person has anemia or a person has polycythemia okay now we are talking about anemia so most of the time anemia is because a because iron is such an important constituent of red blood cells if a person does not uh take enough iron adequate amount of iron or they have some bleeding which is going on say women with excessive menstrual cycles or they have internal bleeding you know they have a uh, rectal polyps which keep bleeding or they you know they have things like that uh you could lose a lot of hemoglobin and they have what is called iron deficiency anemia but anemia could be other types also so there is one kind of anemia which is known as pernicious anemia and this pernicious anemia is due to lack of something known as intrinsic factor it's due to lack of intrinsic factor which is produced in the stomach so pernicious anemia is due to lack of intrinsic factor and why is intrinsic factor important because intrinsic factor helps the body absorb vitamin b12 comes it yeah. it helps the body absorb vitamin b12 and vitamin b12 is needed for red blood cell maturation so if you do not have intrinsic factor you don't absorb vitamin b12 your red blood cells don't mature properly so you have immature red blood cells in the blood stream not able to do their job and you get what is called pernicious anemia another type of anemia is where the hemoglobin is abnormal the shape of the hemoglobin is abnormal so if the shape is abnormal it again cannot do its job and two such conditions where the shape of the uh, hemoglobin molecule is abnormal is called thalassemia and sickle cell anemia in fact in sickle cell anemia the cells instead of being biconcave they are sickle cell like this so they really look like sickles that's why they're called sickle cell and they can get stuck in capillaries and cause clots to form they can lead to strokes if they ha if it happens in the brain they can lead to heart uh, myocardial infarction or heart attacks if it happens in the coronary blood vessel so sickle cell anemia can prove to be dangerous okay another term that we use with blood cells red blood cells is a term where the red blood cells rupture which is known as hemolysis this can occur if there is you know something like mismatched transfusion suppose you give the wrong blood type it can occur with certain viral diseases snake bites 
snake venom. So in hemolysis, the red blood cells actually just rupture. Now, we talked about agglutinins. If you remember in the previous slide, antibodies, which were also called agglutinins, they were present in the plasma. Antigens, which are known as agglutinogens, they are present on the red blood cell surface. And we will do these agglutinins when we talk about agglutinins and agglutinogens. We'll do these when we talk about blood types. So I want you to remember this, that agglutinins or antigen uh, and uh, antibodies are present in the plasma. Agglutinogen or antigen is present on the red cell surface. Okay, so I'm going to repeat it. Antibody or agglutinin is present in the plasma. Antigen or agglutinogen is present on the red cell surface. So here's a picture of red blood cells. So here you can see that you can't see the biconcave thing because this is a flat image, but you can see they don't have nuclei. All these cells which you are seeing, these are white blood cells, all of these. So look at the nucleus present in white blood cells. And these flower-like structures which you see, these are platelets. So now answer this question. In which conditions do you think erythropoietin production would increase? Okay, well, the correct answer is all of the above. And here's why. So in a professional athlete, what is a professional athlete doing? They're exercising all their time, right? So the tissues demand more oxygen. So when, you, when your oxygen needs, the body's oxygen needs are more, automatically the body goes into a state where it decides, oh, you need more oxygen, let me produce more red blood cells so that I can give you more oxygen. So whenever the oxygen demand of the body is more, erythropoiesis would automatically increase, right? So that you, the body needs more, so you give it more. The way you can give it more is producing more red blood cells. Second one, in a person who suffered hemorrhage, what has happened? If they've suffered a severe hemorrhage, they've lost blood. So what has happened to them? Their oxygen carrying capacity is decreased, isn't it? So when your oxygen carrying capacity is decreased, what does the body want to do? The body always wants to maintain homeostasis. So it says, you know, I've lost blood. The only way I can make up for it is let me try and produce more red blood cells so that I can bring back my oxygen carrying capacity to normal. So can you see that? So where your oxygen demand is more or your oxygen carrying capacity has decreased because of some problem, your body will automatically sort of do something to bring it back up. And so the kidneys get stimulated, erythropoietin increases, and you produce uh, erythropoiesis continues, okay? High altitudes. What happens at high altitudes? Your air is rarefied, less oxygen in the air, right? So it becomes difficult. So the body is not able to mop up. It doesn't have enough oxygen. So what it does is it says, let me produce more red blood cells so that if I have more, I can mop up as much oxygen as I can. So and in fact, if you go from sea level to a high altitude, you actually have physiological polycythemia. Athletes tend to have a higher red, especially trained athletes tend to have a higher red cell count normally. And if someone has suffered a hemorrhage, imme immediately after hemorrhage, if you take a count it will decrease it after all the body takes some time to produce erythropoietin but after a few weeks you if you take their cell count you will find that the count increases so if they if it you know went down to say 4 million you'll find after a couple of weeks it might go up a little bit because erythropoietin has been produced okay so can you see all of the above are answers to this think of this procrit is a synthetic erythropoietin why do you think a patient on dialysis or chemotherapy is often given this drug? Hmm. 
you know what is chemotherapy, right? A drug given for cancer to um, kill the cancer cells. And dialysis is when someone has a kidney problem and the kidneys are not flushing the urine, prop they're filtering the blood properly, you need an external service in order to do their job. Okay, the correct answer is number two, and here's why. You see, any patient who has a kidney problem doesn't necessarily have cancer. See, just because I use those two words, dialysis and chemotherapy, don't always link them, okay? You're, here you're saying that every person who is on dialysis is on chemotherapy. In other words, they have cancer. That's not true. Chemotherapy, cancer patients also need erythropoietin or Procrit is because when you're giving somebody can, uh, chemotherapy, cancer treatment is usually cancer cells multiply real fast. So you want to give them a drug that will kill those fast multiplying cells. But in your body, there are other cells which also normally multiply fast, like your hair, hair follicles, your bone marrow cells, your cells of the GI tract. So what, when you give anybody chemotherapeutic drugs, what happens is, have you, know, have you seen anybody with cancer? They usually lose hair. They tend to become anemic. Bone marrow is depressed. They also tend to have nausea and vomiting because the GI tract is involved, right? So these are two separate conditions. So people with chemotherapy become anemic because the, cell, the drugs influence even the normal fast dividing cells of which bone marrow cells are one of them. Dialysis patients, someone is on dialysis, what does it, does it mean? That they have kidney problems. The kidney is not functioning properly. If the kidney is not functioning, what will the kidney also not produce? Erythropoietin, right? Because remember I said the erythropoietin is produced by the kidney. So if erythropoietin is not produced, that means erythropoiesis is not happening normally. If it's not happening normally, what will happen? They are anemic, okay? So therefore, the second one is the right answer. The first one is telling you that kidney patients are on chemotherapy. You don't know that. Every kidney patient, every person on dialysis who has kidney trouble doesn't necessarily have cancer. Okay? So can you see how you should kind of um, sift between the answers? Follow that? And we'll just end the class with showing you something about synthetic erythropoietin. And you may have seen this commercial. And the reason you have to give them synthetic is because these are not functioning pro a job. So you you kind of inject erythropoietin into them, right? Or in, in a patient patient who has cancer but the kidney is functioning, it, it the bone marrow is getting affected. So you need to produce more erythropoietin. So you kind of give them extraneous erythropoietin to help the body's naturally producing one. Follow? Okay? Okay, so we'll stop here. And... Oh, what happened?